Welcome to the latest episode of Rerouting Logistics by Aspie and Search and Selection. I'm John Wilson, the Head of Logistics and Transport. I'm joined in this series by Beverly Bell, who's the former Senior Traffic Commissioner for the UK and CEO of Beverly Bell Training Consultancy. Together, we brought this podcast to raise important issues in the world of logistics, such as diversity, inclusion, young people within the industry and women within logistics. Today, I'm exa- very excited to be and honoured to be joined by Claire Bottom, who's the Chief Executive of the UK Warehousing Association. Claire has led an impressive professional career, which includes no- noteworthy positions such as the Vice Chair of Women in Logistics and the Associate Director of Warehousing for the Coca-Cola. Without further delay, I'd like to hand the mic over to Beverly. Thank you for that introduction, John, and I'm delighted to be talking to you, Claire. Thank you for making the time to come and see us and have a chat to us. I'm going to ask the standard question as an introduction, and then we'll see where we go. So, Claire, a few minutes about yourself and how long you've been in your current role. Great. Well, thank you very much for having me, Beverly. Um, I have been Chief Executive at the UK Warehousing Association for just over two years now. And it's not a role that I ever saw myself doing. I didn't see you doing it either, Claire. So go on, I'm interested (laughs) to hear what you have to say. Well, I'd worked in operational logistics for about 25 years. um, And during that time, I did spend a very short stint at the freight unit at Transport for London. And I'm mentioning that because that's probably the only role where there was any sort of engagement with politics um, because I suppose, you know, Transport for London is part of, it comes under the mayor in London mm. and, and the freight unit was trying to be quite groundbreaking. I was responsible for the very early days of fours before the fabulous Glyn Davis took it over, uh, who did a great job there. Yes, he did. Um, but other than that little stint at Transport for London, I'd never really done any policy work. Um, and I was approached by a recruitment company who said that there was a role going as chief exec of the UK Warehousing Association and I straight away started to think about who I could recommend for that job (laughs) Uh, and I I told them a couple of names and they were sort of really trying to persuade me no no we think you would be a good candidate for it and as I say my background was very operational so at the time I was associate director of warehousing uh, at Coca-Cola looking after a number of warehouses all around the UK Um, and prior to that uh, I'd been working at Lafarge Tarmac uh, in warehousing and transport for them so I didn't see it but now that I'm in the job I'm really glad that somebody else had that vision and persuaded me to go for it. So what attracted you to it? Um, Well I'm very passionate about our industry Um, and I think the thing that clinched it was I started to imagine if somebody else were to get that job and make a mess of it. If somebody else was doing that job badly I would be livid and I'd be cross at myself for not having given it a go. So that, it's quite a negative way of putting it, but I did start to think to myself, oh, but if it was me, I could do this and this and this, and I started to get excited. So you've got good self-belief. Yes, I think that's probably true, yes. Okay, so on that whole subject of self-belief, you are involved in an organisation called Women in Logistics. So, So tell us how you came to be involved in that, and again, why you do that, what's your motivation for it? For sure. Well, that goes back again to my passion for our industry. And of course, an industry is a very abstract concept. What it's really made up of is the people who are in that industry. Um, and within logistics, as, as you and I both know well, it is quite male dominated. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily because um, women are not welcome. I've never really found that to be the case. In fact, I would say logistics, maybe compared to some other sectors, probably is more of a meritocracy. Um, but it's not really a sector where women see themselves starting a career. Um, A lot of women and men who end up in logistics didn't set out on that path. Um, And what we, well, go back, let me go back a bit. Um, I was introduced to the fabulous Ruth Waring uh, by a a logistics consultant called Gwyn Richards. And he said, oh, you don't know Ruth, you must meet her. And I did meet her and I thought she was brilliant. And she was doing some research about the experiences of women who work in the logistics sector. And this was back in 2006. Um, So we made friends uh, and the research that Ruth had done found, as I was saying, you know, women that work in the sector really enjoy it. It's a great place to be. But sometimes things go a little bit wrong and it can be a bit isolating. And women sometimes feel a bit lonely. And Ruth's 
visionary idea was to say, well, wouldn't it be good if there was some sort of group, if there was some sort of solidarity where there would be other people you could talk to who'd face those kinds of issues? Um, and so she started to try and set something up uh, and some powerful voices in the industry tried to deter her. Really? I didn't know that. Right. Well, I'm not going to go gonna, into it in too much depth. Uh, no, I don't know the individuals uh, personally. Uh, and so it wouldn't be fair because they won't get a right of reply. Um, no, I'm only teasing. But uh, I would definitely describe myself as the egger on. I think Ruth got quite deflated and upset at one point, And I was the person saying, no, Ruth, if this is what you believe in, this could have legs. And the thing that changed in 2008, uh, so we're talking a couple of years later, is that LinkedIn had become quite successful in the UK. It started off in America. In 2008, they reached over a million users in the UK. Um, and so Ruth was on the phone back in the old days where people actually had desk phones. And she rang me up and I was on the other end and she said, I'm setting up this group on LinkedIn called Women in Logistics. Will you join? Uh, and I pressed the right buttons and said, has it come up? Yes, it has. So I'm the second member of the LinkedIn group, Women in Logistics. Uh, and four months later, people started to join who we didn't know. And that was a tipping point where we realised that there was an appetite beyond just us and our friends and the people that Ruth had met through some research that I mentioned she was doing. We thought, well, there's more to this. Uh, and so... Um, we got together and had a face-to-face -face meeting. Well, I think at that point we had 40 members on LinkedIn and 19 people turned up in person. We've got over 6,000 now. So I think if half the members turned up to a meeting, we'd have a bigger problem. Uh, but that was 15 years ago. Well, I, I remember being involved in it in the early days in one of the very first meetings. That That's you right. You came and spoke for us and it was, it was transformational, the sort of support that we had from senior people like mm. you. It really made a difference. So thank you. No, no, it's fine. It's, it's interesting. I think there are some couple of things you said there that I want to come back on. So you said women can get lonely, but so can men. That's true, yes. And um, we can sometimes have different coping strategies from them. And then the second question is, do you accept men into women in logistics? That is such a great question. And I'm really glad that you asked it. Because when we had that very first face-to-face -face meeting, one of the things that we talked about was some sort of well, nowadays, I would call it governance. That wasn't the word we used at mm. the time, but some sort of ground rules about how our organisation might operate. Uh, and we were all absolutely d determined right from the start that men would definitely be welcome to be part of it. Because after all, we're about equality for women, not supremacy. Uh, and in order to achieve that equality, um, it's not just women's job to do that it's the job of the sector which includes a lot of men as well and you made a comment before about women don't necessarily wake up in life and go i want to go into the logistics sector they fall into it it's the same for men as well isn't it yes. most people tend to fall into the sector and it's quite unusual for people when they're young to say oh i want to go and work in logistics how do you in your capacity both as you know, your role in UKWA and your role in women logistics, how do you encourage people to go into the sector? When when I was travelling here today, um, my colleague and I were chatting about logistics and the lady on the train said, oh, my son actually wants to go into logistics, wow. which was, I know, wow. So we've obviously connected on LinkedIn. Uh, but that's quite unusual. If you were on that train journey, how would you say in one or two sentences why they should go into logistics? Well, I would or at logistics warehousing, the whole the whole, supply the whole chain. thing, yes. So I would probably start by talking about business because I think there probably are quite a lot of young people who are interested in a career in business. Uh, and what I would go on to say is, what if I could tell you that there's a particular part of the business world which is crying out for people with the sorts of skills that you've got? So they might be uh, skills of troubleshooting and fixing problems, skills of leading big groups of people, skills of dealing with huge amounts of money and financial planning and management. Um, and, and that area is called logistics. And you might think you don't know about it, um, but it doesn't really matter on a technical level because there are plenty of people who can mm. teach you that. It's about having that aptitude and motivation to want to solve problems, lead people, manage budgets. And, and if that's the sort of business career that might interest you, then I would say absolutely go into logistics. And the next 
next thing that I would mention is the brilliant programme Generation Logistics, which I really respect. So that's a programme which has got a small amount of government funding and has managed to attract funding from all across the industry um, and create some content which, let's be honest, is not aimed at you and me, Beverly. This content is aimed at a different demographic. And I think it's certainly the best content of its type that has been produced thus far and seems to be engaging more young people in the logistics Uh, concept. Yeah, and that started from Steve Granite, didn't it? With Think Logistics and then morphed into Generation Logistics. Yes, and you had Steve Granite on your podcast, didn't you? I did, yes. Well, let's encourage the listeners to go back and listen to that one. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, So let's just sort of take a bit of a diversion now. Uh, I know you like to party. Maybe. And I know that you like to go to dinners. Sometimes. And I know that a couple of weeks ago you went to a CILT dinner and you were going to get the early train home. I was. And one of your friends, she shall remain nameless, suggested you should stay a little while. She said I was a party pooper. She said you're a party pooper. Why did she ask you to stay a little while, Claire? Don't be embarrassed, you can tell us. Well, initially I thought she was asking me to stay so that we could boogie, have a few drinks and party the night away. And there was some truth in that. But it turned out that I was going to be the recipient of the Sir Robert Lawrence Award, which is a Lifetime Achievement Award from CILT. And to say I was gobsmacked would be an understatement. I honestly had not the slightest inkling. I was sitting there in my chair at this dinner. Uh, and it got to the, it's the very last award of a number of awards. Uh, and it got to the Sir Robert Lawrence. And I was thinking to myself, I really hope a woman has won this. And so I was sitting there listening to what they were going to say. And they started to read a citation. And they said, she, something, something. And I thought, yes, good, it's a woman. And then I listened more carefully. And I thought, hang on, this sounds quite familiar. And it turned out to be a little story about my career. And I was the winner of this award, which was such an accolade. I was really, really pleased because I've been a member and then a fellow of CILT all throughout my career. And I think it's a great organisation. So why are awards like that important? Well, I would have sympathy with people that say uh, there's something quite trivial about using awards uh, as a form of recognition. Uh, And of course, when you think about something like the gender pay gap, you would say paying people properly is is the sort of recognition that's important. Um, So I say I would have sympathy with that as a view. But I also believe that awards are incredibly important because they raise people up and create role models. um, And particularly with an award like the Sir Robert Lawrence. I think I'm only the fourth woman to have won it, and it's been going since the 1980s. Um, I, I, I think it's it's great to see people from all walks of life being recognised. I mean, Elaine Allett won it a couple of years ago, and, and she was um, somebody with a, a very sort of modest background, but really hardworking well, and well-respected. Just for the benefit of our listeners, just say a little bit about Elaine. <laughs> well, yeah. I, don't, I don't know all that much right, about okay. her, but I, I know that she, she won it a couple of years ago uh, in, in a different set of circumstances, but as a sort of recognition of the hardworking people of the logistics sector um, during the period of the pandemic, uh, when I think perhaps members of the general public became a bit more receptive to the idea that logistics is really critical for our society and our economy. Well, it's that phrase, isn't it? You don't appreciate something until you don't have it anymore. Yes. So looking at the other end of the career, um, let's go back to when you, you, know, you first leave school and you go for your first job interview. Okay? Uh, if we wind back the clock now and ask about your job interview, what advice would your sister give you for your job interview? Well, she would tell me to smile. And I know this because I asked her. (laughs) I thought you were going to ask me about this, Beverly. And I said to my sister, my sister is a lot more altruistic than me. She works for the Red Cross. Uh, And I said to her, if I was going for a job, what what advice would you give me? And she was shocked and said, you're not going for another job, are you? Which I'd like to reassure you and your listeners, no, I'm not. Um, And she said, oh, you must always smile, not only because... Uh, it builds rapport with the person who's interviewing you, but it makes you feel better as well, doesn't it? So don't let yourself get too stressed and tense and upset. So good advice from my sister there, I think. As long as it's natural and not put on. Yeah, well, sometimes you've got to fake it till you make it. I'll remember that. Okay. So tell us one thing about yourself that nobody knows right now or you think a lot of people don't know right now. Well, I think the thing that people might not know about me, because it was quite a long time ago, I am quite old now, um, is that 
when I first left school and went to university, I studied the history of art. Oh. So um, I was really fascinated by uh, the architecture and stained glass of the medieval period. Um, I, I loved studying sort of modern art and, uh, and what is the meaning of art, that kind of question. Um, and I'd studied the history of art for A-level because I'm quite privileged and I went to quite a posh school and that's where that was a, a subject that was available to us. And it was absolutely my favourite A-level and that's why I chose to go to university to do the history of art. We won't ask how you went from history of art to what you do in the UK and Warehousing Association. Uh, there's not much of an overlap there, but I suppose, um, you know, it's probably worth saying I subsequently did um, a master's degree distance learning at Aston in logistics. Um, and I think um, degree level qualifications can be really beneficial, um, but they're not always a prerequisite in our sector, are they? No, absolutely not. So just about UKWA for a moment or two, why would I become a member of UKWA if that was the work that I did? It's a great question, Beverly, and I think there's no simple answer to that, mainly because we've got quite a range of different sorts of members. We've got nearly a thousand members now in UKWA. It's, are it's they corporate members or individuals? Corporate. corporate. Uh, so all of our members are companies. Yeah. Um, but our mission comes in four parts. So I'll just briefly explain the four things that we do. We only do four things. That's what I like about you, Claire. It doesn't matter what question I ask. You give me the answer that you want to get over. Well, I'm hoping that this will answer your question because the four things that we do are the things that we believe will attract even more members to come and join. And the first thing is we talk about warehousing. Now, that sounds a bit trite, doesn't it? And, you know, we talk, for example, I'm talking about it now on this podcast um, and I sometimes give lectures at universities and, you know, that sort of thing. But even more important than that, we talk to the media and the government mm. about the importance of warehousing. And some of our members come to us for that because they want us to have that voice so that warehousing can't continue to be overlooked. And I think maybe we'll come back to talk about some political topics. So, yeah, talking about warehousing is one reason people join us. The second thing that we do is we raise standards with it within the industry. And we do that, for example, by introducing a warehouse manager's CPC qualification, which we're going to launch next year. At the moment, there's no recognised qualification for a warehouse manager. Now, one of the ways you can raise standards is to introduce something that's of really good quality. And so that's, uh, you know, just one example. And we do some other stuff around shared best practice. Who's and going to teach you? Um, so at the moment, the two tutors for that are Gwyn Richards and Ruth Waring. Uh, and they've prepared the material. And once it's been accredited by CILT, which is a process we're yes, currently going right. through, then anybody would be able right. uh, to teach that as so long as they can meet the standards that are required by us and by CILT. So raising of standards in the sector. The third thing that we do, and I don't know that trade associations always do this, but it's very important to us at UKWA is building community. Mm. So... Sometimes people in warehousing feel like what they do is not that well respected, yeah. maybe not even that important. Or even understood or known about. That's right. So they can feel like they're second best to manufacturing or the poor cousins of transport. No disrespect to you, Beverly, but, you know, yeah. warehousing doesn't always get the status, the elevated status that it deserves. And by building community, what we hope to do both online and face to face is make people feel that they're part of something really valuable and important. And then the fourth part of our mission is we just help our members. So that's a pretty straightforward reason why people might want to join. And for example, um, from a legal perspective, we have a set of conditions of contract, which are industry leading, which some insurers will demand of warehousing companies to use our conditions of contract. And you have to be a member for that. So that's an example of the type of help that we provide. OK, that's really helpful in terms of setting out why people would become members. What about the help with the career and the networking and the business to business, how does that work? So we do some of that and it's through this raising of standards that I spoke about. So the qualification, uh, we've done already some training that's not a recognised qualification, but warehouse manager training uh, and the provision of events, which can be CPD recognised events. Um, but where people are looking as an individual for professional support in their career, we also signpost them to CILT okay. because that's yeah. the professional body. So we work in conjunction with that organisation uh, and we augment some of what they offer for individuals. OK. You talked about government before. Um, who do you prefer to engage with, the MPs and the ministers or the civil servants? And who do you think makes the 
more important decisions. So I might go off piece here again a little bit. I'm just going to tell you a little story about civil servants, just from my point of view. So this is this is quite a new world for me. Uh, I know a lot about how to run warehouses and I've got an operational background. Uh, and when I first joined UKWA in this role, I was somewhat daunted by the prospect of having to engage in this governmental parliamentary type stuff. Civil servants, 80% of them are doing as little work as possible. And 20% of them are really, really hard working. Gosh, now, that's a bold statement. Uh, yes, I accept that. And from my point of view, the 80% never come to any meetings that I attend. Whereas the 20% are people who tend to be very knowledgeable, very helpful, very engaged and very clever. But the knowledgeable is about parliamentary matters and not about warehousing. Mm. So I tend to find that when I'm talking to civil servants... I'm often engaging with people who are really, really clever and bright and have gone into this line of work because they're compelled to want to make a difference. They see governmental processes as being part of how we make the world a better place. But most of them don't know very much about warehousing. And actually, that's quite an advantage for me. What, what I've learned is that because... I know our sector really well and I spend a lot of time visiting warehouses and making sure that I'm really in touch with what's going on amongst our membership. Um, then all I've really got to do is, is to relay the truth of warehousing to people who want to understand it. And that's not as difficult as I thought it was going to be. So saying 80% of the civil servants do as little as possible, could an alternative explanation be that they do a lot of work behind the scenes that you don't see? That's also possible. Yes, I do accept that. I was trying to be a bit controversial and perhaps I should have no, been No, no, I like cautious. it. I like it. I like I like you being controversial. And there's always the H20 rule, isn't there, in that you're always engaged with a smaller proportion, but there might be the people behind the scenes who are providing the briefings, providing the information. True. So would you make that same comment about MPs then? 80% of them do as little as possible and 20% of them work really hard. Um, and ministers... <laughs> Well, you said that, Beverly. I, I just I, asked it as a question, Claire. <laughs> um, All I, right, I, let, me, let me ask it another way. Do you find that you are engaging with certain MPs, certain ministers all the time, rather than a much broader section of them, much broader group of them? Well, I've got something to say to almost any MP, and not just from Westminster, you know, including the devolved authorities, uh, on the basis that warehousing is an important part of the economy all mm. across the UK. And, you know, the clues in the title, the UK Warehousing Association, mm. we've made an effort to have more of a presence in Northern Ireland, in Scotland, in Wales, by holding events uh, in those locations, because, you know, it's important for every MP to see this as a part of you know, the opportunities for jobs in their area as a part of the UK's prosperity. Um, but I, I can also agree with the sentiment that they vary in their level of interest. So who would you spend more time engaging with, the civil servants or the ministers and the MPs? Well, they're both important. Now you've got to have one. Um, I think if I've got to have one, then certainly in the current political climate it would have to be the civil servants mm. because you might perceive there could be a change of administration yes. yeah okay um so that's all about work let's switch off from work for a moment so when you want to relax long walk quick run jog something else neither ne never, neither. A jog, never a job never a job so my husband is a he doesn't call it a jogger, a runner. My husband's a runner and he's run several marathons and a couple of ultra marathons, which are these crazy like 50 kilometer runs. And I mean, I, I highly respect it, but I have not the slightest inclination to join him on any of that. But I do love a walk. So definitely walking for me. So is that your natural way of relaxing? Yes. Do you get time to relax? Um, I have a pact with myself that I walk two miles a day and I've been doing that for... In the last 18 months. Wow, I'm impressed. Yeah, well, I'm it's impressed. important. You, you, nobody else is going to carve out time for you. You've got to carve that time out for yourself. So what's the trick then to getting the work-life balance? Um, well, I don't like the term work-life balance. Oh, why not? Because I tend to describe that as work-home balance. Because if you see work as being the opposite of life, it's okay. almost as though you've ended up in a career that doesn't suit you. And I think if you are passionate about your work, which I really am, then it doesn't have to feel like it's 
a penalty or, you know, a penance to have to do it. But it's still important to have the balance, so I don't dispute that. Um, and, yeah, sometimes I'm not very good at getting that balance right, but making sure that I get out into the fresh air and have a walk is part of it. Okay. And then theatre, cinema, ballet or opera? Definitely theatre. I love stories. You like stories? I suppose they all have stories in them. Uh, I've only been to the opera and the ballet a couple of times. Um, They're not as easily accessible, are they? But where I live in the East Midlands, we have a great theatre scene, so I really like the theatre. Okay, and then football, rugby or something else? It's snooker. Snooker? (laughs) Yeah. And I'm not very good at playing. No, I, I wasn't expecting that. I absolutely love snooker. So uh, I try and get to Sheffield every year to go to the World Championship. Uh, and you may remember in the recent World Championship, um, there was a Just Stop Oil protest. Yes, I'm in was. the photos. I was Were on the you front... throwing the orange powder? I wasn't the one with the orange powder, but I was on the front row watching that match. It was Robert Milkins playing. I remember it very clearly. And suddenly somebody from the audience leapt up and jumped onto the table. So that was probably the most shocking thing that's ever happened at the snooker. But I have seen some drama. I mean, snooker is it's absolutely my favourite sport to watch. Well, quite dramatic when the Just Stop Oil people came. Does the end justify them? Does the means justify the end or the end justifies the means? You understand the question I'm asking. I do. And I think... Um, I I think the right to protest is really, really important. So I would protect that even when it's quite disruptive to me and my lifestyle. Perhaps if I had been held up when travelling, I would have been a little bit less sympathetic. And, you know, I understand that people get very angry about that. But the climate crisis is a crisis. Because they they, um, recently... um Les Mis, I think it was the production of Les Mis, wasn't yes, it? They, they interrupted, they that's right. Well, Les Mis is a dreadful, dreadful show. I don't like it. Oh, so. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I love a bit of misery in me. I think it's marvellous. It's so depressing. I mean, the songs are quite good. I'll give, I'll give them that, but so depressing. No, I think go, go for it. Okay. Um, so, where are you going to be in five years, Claire? <sighs> in five years? Well... I don't really know. Where would you like to be in five years? Well, I've got big plans for the UK Warehousing Association. That doesn't surprise me. I'm part way through a a multi-year strategy. But once that's delivered, I don't really want to sort of stay in the same job ad infinitum, which I think sometimes people do when they come into these types of jobs. And I definitely don't mean anyone from UKWA, but perhaps, you know, others might have overstayed their welcome and I'm not going to fall into that trap Uh, but as to what I do next one of the problems I face is that in fact when I was first approached about the job at UKWA I was just about still in my 40s and that's on the young side for somebody to take on a job like this so there isn't really a tried and tested track record of what you're supposed to do next after you've led a trade association um so uh, probably the only person I can think of who's done that would be Tim Morris, who was at the UK Major Ports Group and went on to work in public affairs uh, for one of the big port companies. So there might be an opportunity of that nature, but to be honest, I don't really know. But you'll carve something out. I mean, when I was a TC, everybody was half dead anyway by the time you were appointed. <laughs> They'd already retired from their main job and I was only 40. I should have um, thought of this, Beverly. I should have come to you for some mentoring on this question, right? <laughs> no, you don't right? want me to mentor. You'd be <laughs> hopeless. But the point is, well, it's, you're making your, your own path, aren't you? Yes. Because, and I said I'd only do 10 years. I ended up doing 17, so I fell into the category you've just just described of not necessarily outstaying my welcome. But I think you'll forge your own, your own path. Yeah, and there are so many things that I want to achieve. My timescale for those achievements is quite ambitious and I'm fearful that I might not quite do it as quick as I'm hoping. So if you don't achieve your objective, what's your natural state? Give up? No. Get help? Carry on? Change your objectives? Bit of everything? Um, a bit of everything. And I, I would definitely pay tribute to my board of directors at UKWA okay. because I've got some great people there who are just as passionate as I am about the industry. And, you know, I've put forward to them some proposals of things that I would like to do that might be unusual, might be expensive, might be not the normal way of doing stuff. And those guys have 
been entirely supportive. So I think if I found myself in trouble, my first port of call would be our board of directors. That's, that's great to know. Thank you. And finally, if listeners must remember one thing from this interview podcast, what would it be? As far as you're concerned, <laughs> um, it would be that people can take on jobs that they think they might not be ready for. And I think there's a, there's a quote from Richard Branson, isn't there? You know, if someone asks you to do something and you don't know how to do it. Say yes and then learn how to do it. Um, and I would definitely encourage your listeners to take that approach to their careers. OK, thank you. So now we can do a bit of turning the tables. And if you'd like to, you don't have to, it's not compulsory, you can ask me a couple of questions, anything you wanted to ask a recovering traffic commissioner and were afraid to ask, really. Yes, I have got a question for you, and I want to take you back to uh, an event where I was in the audience and you and I had never met. Um, and uh, you were up on stage with Nikki King oh, and Hilary DeVay and Annie it. Preston. Yes. Uh, and you were talking... Rebecca Jenkins. Yes, and Rebecca Jenkins, that's right, from SEVA. Uh, and you guys were talking about um, the fact that there were so few women in our mm. sector. Um, and you were really putting your heads above the parapet, mm. almost as role models for people like me. And I just wondered... First of all, have you got any gossip about those other women? And then secondly, um, who were your role models? Because, you know, I can't... The, there were so few women that I was able to look up to. I think I've just named them. And then there are, must have been so few for you as the first female traffic commissioner. I remember that event really well. It was run by Logistics UK, which was then the FTA. Theo de Poncier set it up. That's right. And I was asked to go along, so I put on my Marks and Spencer suit <laughs> and rocked up. And the inimitable Nikki King was there, uh, as was Hillary, in her power-dressed, you know, Those two shoulder both pads. loved their fashion, right? They're, they're such, yes. I had no idea who they were, to, to be honest. <laughs> right. No idea. Um, I didn't have a role model. Right. Because I'd just gone into the transport sector and, and I was just in the judicial side of it, so I didn't have a role model. If I have a role model now, mm -hmm. it's Mary Berry. <laughs> wow. Because to keep going and to be so she, full of life. She looks cool. Yes. She wears clothes from Zara, which I could never pull off in a million years. She's got dreadful arthritis, but she still bakes. Yeah. She's got a great sense of fun. Mm -hmm. and she's my role model um in life in terms of work um i haven't really got one no i think no. i'm the other way i know what things shouldn't be rather you can learn than a lot from a bad boss not so much a bad boss it's more about culture Okay. I think. I mean, I look at, I suppose my role models are the younger generation. We, we've taken on a lady in our office and she's been here and she's only in her early 20s. And she doesn't give us stuff about anything. She just goes and does it. And I think that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean that with respect when I say that, you know, she will just go and do something. And if she does it wrong, she'll go, oh, well, I've learned. I won't do it again. I'll move on. I never had that confidence. Probably our generation didn't have that confidence. So I think the role models actually are the are the younger people, not yeah. necessarily. The, do you see what I'm saying? I do, and I think it goes back to I've been rereading re Black Box Thinking by Matthew Side. I don't know if you know that book, but it's about seeing failure as an opportunity to learn. And it just sounds very simple when you describe it in one sentence, but it's really hard to do that. It's really hard not to get downhearted and emotional about failure, but to step back and be objective and say, I'm going to learn something from this. And I think you're right. Young people are much better at doing that. So, yes. Yeah, I get it. Thank yeah, you. I, th I think now. So that's what I would say in answer to that, answer that question. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, or is that the only one I've got to uh, answer? On no, that? I think that's it. good. Uh, well, unless you've got any scandalous gossip. Uh, if I had, I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to remember. <laughs> many, many years ago, I once went. I made the fatal mistake when I was very young of having too much to drink at the office Christmas party. We've all been there. Mm -hmm. I was only about twenty five. I remember going into town the next day and seeing the senior partner and I went, oh my God, Mr. Parkinson, I'm so sorry. He went, Beverly, I always have a policy of never remembering what happened at the Christmas party. And I thought that was really gracious. 
Yes. So I couldn't possibly remember any discussions that <laughs> Nikki or Hillary <laughs> or Rebecca or I had. What I will say is I'm still very friendly with Nikki. Good. And if I were to pick one role model in the transport sector, it would be Nikki. Yes. And in a way, she's very similar to the young lady I've just talked about. Mm -hmm. Nikki just does what she wants to do. And she learns from things that don't go to, in her Ab favour. Absolutely. Yeah. And to her, customer service is everything. Mm -hmm. And I can just hear her now going, well done for saying that, Beverly, because that was always her mantra, customer service, customer service. And so I suppose that's what I've learned. So anyway, anything else you'd like to say, Claire, before I, before I um, wind <laughs> this up? Have you enjoyed it? Anything you want to add? Well, I think... I'd like to say thank you for inviting me and being so kind to me. I was thinking that I was going to get grilled, but it's been a lovely chat, so thank you. No, that's a pleasure. Claire, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly and Claire, for being here today. Really enjoyed today's topic and really inspirational on role models. I actually think you both are inspiring young people within logistics today and both women within the sector as well, so thank you very much. So again, if you've enjoyed this podcast, then please follow us on our socials. You can contact the team on 0151 209 2050. And please follow and like and share on LinkedIn and YouTube. Thank you.